it's obvious a guy like me is going to live alone for the rest of his life. At least I know it. So I've kind of found that A&E History Channel person that lives inside. And when I'm between tours living in the city of Coors in Los Angeles, I just kind of hole up on my own. And uh, by 8 p.m., I'm just in front of the computer on Google or eBay, buying things I don't need and finding out 80 more things about Che Guevara I didn't know before, and hoping that History International has a 12-hour documentary on the Spanish Inquisition and not just a paltry three-hour one. <laughs> And that's the kind of miserable asshole I am, so no one calls, no one comes over, but I have really refined my jack-off technique. Uh, I, what else are you going to do? Uh, you know, it gets late at night, a man wants some loving, and if there's no one around, you just have to love yourself. I love you, I love you too. So, what are you going to do? Now, knowing is one thing that uh, perhaps some of you don't know about me, or maybe some guys have this thing too. I have a particularly, I don't want to say violent, I have a particularly enthusiastic uh, post-ejaculatory refractory period. Um, so I utilize a crash helmet. Yeah, um, and, and this is a weird thing. I put the crash helmet on, and upon cinching up the chin strap, involuntarily, tears start to stream down my face. And when I put the bite plate in, <laughs> I start to sob uncontrollably, and with the first stroke, it's like, <laughs> and then I don't remember anything else. I don't remember what the fantasy was or anything, um, and I, I, I'm so happy I found out about the crash helmet. I tend to wake up several hours later in a different part of the house than where I started. <laughs> Two times, super embarrassing, I woke up in my driveway. Naked, save for the crash helmet. This, this second time was extremely embarrassing because I was in the fetal position, sleeping it off. And I woke up and there's a FedEx envelope next to my face. With, yeah, with a post-it, with a post-it on there that said, uh, I signed for you, FedEx man. Because I didn't want a, you to touch my pen. So. And so I, I, I do that, and now, now you know. So basically what I'm saying, there's really no one to talk to. There's really no conversation to have with anybody. So you find yourself kind of lonely and starved for real in intellectual engagement. But yet, I had this fascinating, surreal conversation a few weeks ago in Los Angeles. Um, I was at the office pretending to work, and road manager Mike was preparing a tour that came rumbling through your town a few months ago. It was the Rise Above Tour benefiting the West Memphis Three. Thanks a lot. So, uh, we're getting this tour ready, and we have shot a video for this album that we did two years ago called Rise Above. And we shot a video for the song Rise Above, which is a Greg Ginn composition, exceedingly amazing. It, it could be the next national anthem. It's about a minute long. It's one of the greatest riffs, one of the greatest lyrics. It's just, it's a perfect song. Mike, the road manager at the office, asked me about the video. Okay, so I go running around the office. I can't find the video. So... I remember the videos at my house. I go, Mike, I'll go get the video. I'll be right back. So I get in my car. I go around the corner up the hill to my house. I walk into my house and I look out the back door. It's made of glass. And I see a man, an adult man, about five foot seven, white shirt, brown pants, brown shoes, with surgeon's gloves on and a tool. And he seems to be doing surgery on my windowsill. And there's a one and a half second, what the fuck, be very still type of thing you go through, you're like, whoa, whoa, am I, am I dreaming? Am I high? Or is there a man with surgeon's gloves and a tool operating on my windowsill? You go into total denial mode. What is he doing? Perhaps he's my window guy? Do I have a window guy? I have window people? Whoa. Is he from Homeland Defense? Just checking for Al-Qaeda cells. Sometimes they burrow in the caulking between the pain and the sill, sir. It's all part of the Patriot Act. 58,000 words of Kafka-esque legalese that not even the president can get through. Don't worry. And all these obtuse terms uh, means we just get to put our hands up your ass anytime we want. So just go on and be very afraid of us. We're the government. Fuck you. <laughs> so... I stand there going, ah, ah, what do I do? Do I leave? Do I get on the phone? What do I do? And in that moment of me going, ah, ah, the man stops his work, 
puts the tool down, looks up, sees me, a beautiful smile goes across his face, and he waves, and he says, Hey! How are you? And the most insane conversation I've ever had in Southern California <laughs> starts right at that moment. Now, being somewhat a polite lad, not that I've displayed any of that so far this evening, I am somewhat polite. So when he said, Hey! How are you? I stupidly answer back, Fine, thank you! And then I asked him a stupid question, How are you? And then a stupider question, May I help you? What am I thinking? The man points to a house next door to me, and he says, your, your neighbor let me in. The neighbor is dead. Uh, 97 years of age is a pretty good achievement, I think. So what are you doing? And he went, well, you have a front door buzzer, right? I went, front door buzzer? It's like one non sequitur weird thing after another. This conversation is now going into its second utterly surreal minute. I go, door buzzer? Neighbor? What are you doing? 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 He's like, uh... Uh, well, you have a neighbor, and there's a buzzer. No, 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 forget the neighbor, forget the buzzer. Okay, I'll tell you what you're doing. He's like, oh, okay, maybe he needs help. You know, remembering his motivation in this scene. And so I said, you're a burglar. You're breaking into my house. He went, no, no. Now, when you call someone a burglar, that's some pretty heavy shit. You know, you better be able to back that up. So I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Then what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And then he said something totally insane. He said, let me in. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. I don't have a gun. Be a man. Be a man? Let you in? You don't have a gun? What, if I don't let you in, I'm a pussy? Is that it? You're like pushing my, my ever-decreasing sense of masculinity. He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, are you what? Ah. I said, let's see some ID. He's like, I... I don't have to show you ID. He doesn't. Fuck. I go, how about this? I'll show you my ID and I'll call up the cops and they'll come over, they'll show you their ID and we'll get in the backyard and we'll have to get to know each other party. What do you think about that? He's like, no! I go, then tell me what you're doing at my window with surgeon's gloves on. He goes, I, I work for the cable company. I go, really? I don't have cable. And then he asked me the last utterly surreal question. He said, well, would you like me to leave the same way I came in? There's, this is a, 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 you can answer either yes or no. It's a yes or no question. What if I say no? No, you can't leave the same way you came in. What does he do? Put on his rocket pack? Okay, then. Does he go back into the lamp that he came from? I'll just wait here until you rub the lamp. Does he say, I like my chicken soup with extra salt and I want my latte and make it snappy. I'm moving in. What if I say yes? Does he say, I am Hassan? I don't know. So I just, with my eyes riveted on his midsection to see if he doesn't go for a handgun, I just kind of go, well, okay, go for it. He goes, fine, then I'm leaving. He's totally indignant that I'm kicking him out. He's like, fine. <laughs> He's gone. So I run through the house. I grab the phone, punch in 911, and I run to the driveway to see this guy, $6 million, manning it down the road. <laughs> on. The cops answer. I go, hey, okay, you know my name and address because you get it when, on the computer when I call. Okay, here's a guy. Tried to break into my house. Uh, no hair. White shirt, brown pants, brown shoes, run like a motherfucker down the road. Get him. And they go, okay. And I hang up the phone. I get an idea. I call Mike over the, over the office. I go, Mike, check it out. Go outside right now. See if you see a guy about five foot seven, no hair, white shirt, brown pants, brown shoes, run like a motherfucker. He's like, I do. I see a guy, no hair, white shirt, brown pants, brown shoes, run like a motherfucker. I go, that guy tried to break into my house. He goes, I'm on it. So there goes Mike, like a shot, running west on Hollywood Boulevard. I get another idea. I call the cops back. Hi! I'm the guy who called about the guy. Check it out. Now there's two guys. Okay. First guy, no hair, white shirt, brown pants, brown shoes, running like a motherfucker. Second guy, big fella, dark hair, black shirt, black pants, holding a cell phone. First name, Mike. Answers to Mike. Don't shoot him. Shoot the other guy. And by the way, here's his phone number. Give him a call. They do. And with Mike's coordinates, that's how the police helicopter that went right over my roof knew where to go. I hear the sirens, I hear the chopper, it's like LA, the video game. It was amazing. So we have air surveillance, foot pursuit, three cop cars are descending upon the scene. The guy goes into an ap uh, apartment parking lot structure, poof, he's gone like Houdini. Never saw him again. Within a few 